We've all experienced ways the COVID-19 pandemic has fast-tracked digital health innovation. But as we all know, a number of challenges stand in the way of digital health realizing its full potential in low and middle income countries, whether it's a lack of digital infrastructure or funding that is attached to health verticals or disease specific initiatives. Today, I'm joined by several experts who will speak to the partnerships that have helped them take digital health solutions to scale. Benjamin Fells is the founder and CEO of MacroWise, a technology company with products that precision match supply to future demand increasing access and cutting waste. Safa Naragi is vice president of delivery at Zenesis, which builds data integration software that helps governments view and analyze all of their data in one place. Dr. Ernest Darko is founder, founding partner and co-founder of Broadreach Group, which partners with payers, providers, and national health authorities on healthcare delivery with an AI powered platform that pro provides predictive and prescriptive decision support. And Dr. Julian Atim, is program lead for primary health care at Global Health Labs, which is a nonprofit organization created in 2020 by Gates Ventures, the private office of Bill Gates, in support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's priorities. We also have an illustrator joining us, and I'm really excited to see how the ideas from today's conversation fill that blank canvas. Uh, so we'll take a look at that a bit later today um, toward the conclusion of our conversation. Before I dive into questions for our speakers, I do wanna note that this session is live and we'd love to see audience questions in the chat. It's been really fun seeing who all is joining us from around the world. And I know many of you are either working directly on digital health solutions or care a lot about the future of digital health and seeing it scale. Um, so please keep those questions coming in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. So first a question for Benjamin, for Safa, for Ernest. I've shared a little bit about what each of your organizations do, but I would love for you to narrow in on what about your approach has made your model successful. And I have a hunch, it's part of why each of you were selected for Prescription for Progress, that this approach has something to do with partnership. So maybe we'll start with Benjamin. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so I'll, I, I'd like to start by, by talking about David Senge um, and, and our work with the government of Sierra Leone began with a, a cold email to Dr. Senge that he wrote back within the hour. Dr. Senge is a government minister with multiple key portfolios. His degree of commitment to structural innovation is truly remarkable. Uh, he's also a musician, uh, an amazing human being. The DSTI, and, and this is one of the institutions that he leads, and the Ministry of Health and Sanitation is remarkably engaged in our work. And I think about this as just showing up with a, a focus and, and a determination. The focus of our work with Sierra Leone is layering intelligence into existing infrastructure. And Mikala Maki, who's the director of DSTI, I, I think put it quite well. Our technology allows the health system to pull all of the ends together, in her words. And our product has a distinct point of view. It's, by, it's not meant to be neutral. Crucial systems need to be predictive, must be capable of anticipating where demand will shift, where, where is their risk, where is their opportunity to, to care for, for mo more of those in need, where does supply need to go. Organizations don't need more software. They need system intelligence. And, and I'd like to just conclude here with this, again, to return to to Dr. Senge and, and use his PhD thesis as a metaphor for technology at its best. So when he was at MIT, he developed a, a, a way to improve prosthetic limbs. A, a prosthetic is, is a technology that enables the whole body to be more productive, do what it could not do before. And it's, and it's not just the limb that is replaced, it's really, again, enabling the whole of body all technology must unlock all of system productivity, all of system ambition. So, so perhaps we can look at this notion of, 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 of a way of improving prosthetic limbs as a, as a metaphor for how we might introduce technology into complex systems. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks, Benjamin. I love that prosthetic limbs metaphor and hadn't thought of that before. Um, great great uh, description of what sets MacroWise apart in terms of your approach. Um, moving now to Safa, I've, I've got also gotten the chance to know Zenesis in my reporting over the years for DevEx. Um, so I'm somewhat familiar with what makes your approach unique, but for those who are less familiar, can you tell us a little bit more about 
Zenesis and um, how you have managed to scale your work and to what extent does partnerships play into that? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for that, Catherine. And, and first off, it's great to be part of this panel here with my colleagues and, and really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, uh, I, I think uh, when, when I think of this, a few points come to mind. And, and, and the first of these uh, about our approach is, is realizing the importance of uh, trust building in what we do and ultimately the goal of achieving accessible and equitable healthcare. Um, Silicon Valley, as many of us know, is, is uh, you know, defined by this engineering mindset that's uh, we tend to think of or oh, look at the world's problems as engineering problems, really. And, and of course, um, we're part of that ecosystem and, and we believe that talented engineers uh, can do a lot to make the world a better place. Uh, but we also different from that ecosystem in that we actually don't believe that technology is enough. Uh, without trust, um, we believe you, you, you really can't get anything done, no matter how good your technology is. Uh, secondly, I think I'll speak to the ethos of moving quickly. Um, so we believe that too many things move too slowly in public health and uh, in global health more broadly, uh, we see the consequences of this all over the world. Uh, we think that, you know, healthcare is always urgent from the viewpoint of the people who need it. And uh, um, part of what has made us approach successful in our work is really that that uh, um, we help countries move fast, and, and, and I mean very fast, towards achieving the goals that they need to achieve. Uh, finally, and, and probably one of the more interesting points is our approach towards user-driven product development. Um, we've had to figure out non-traditional ways to ensure that uh, our clients' needs drive our product development. Uh, this is because traditional methods, um, such as surveys or interviews, uh, are, are really difficult to implement in the places that we work. So as a result, we've, we've dedicated on the ground staff to user engagement, which means that we're consistently listening and, 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 and appreciating our users' needs and wants. Uh, by creating a strong connection between our user engagement teams and our, our, our engineering teams, um, uh, we've, we've created innovation flows in both directions. Uh, so this, uh, I'd say, iterative and, and, and two-way approach helps the platform be more accessible, more useful, and really scalable for the people who drive health outcomes. Uh, I, I think I, I can talk about all of these topics for hours. Um, so I'll just end off there and would be more than happy to to jump into any of these points maybe later on in the conversation. Thank you so much, Safa. And yeah, for those of you joining us on Zoom, um, I've asked uh, colleagues of each of our speakers to join us in the chat if possible so that they can engage further. So if you have questions for the Zenesis team, uh, feel free to jump into the chat. Um, you mentioned trust and I wanted to really uh, emphasize that um, this session is part of one of our four tracks of programming at Prescription for Progress, and this track being on digital health tools, access, scale, and trust. And your point, without trust, you can't get anything done, no matter how good your technology is. I see that theme over and over in my reporting, and I'm so glad to emphasize it in this session. So thank you. Um, I want to bring Ernest into this conversation. So Ernest, again, I provided a very brief preview of what Broadreach Group does, but can you tell us a little bit more about your approach and and how partnerships are central to your model. Thank you so much for having me in this conversation. I think um, there's really three things that have made our approach unique. The first is we have deep uh, healthcare domain expertise, and this is what I mean by this is we actually did not start out as a technology company. Uh, we started out as a health systems implementation uh, company doing large scale implementation of health programs and large scale fixing of healthcare systems. And then we backed into the technology from uh, as a year 2014, about the time when um, some of the more interesting fourth industrial revolution modalities uh, started to surface. So we have a really deep, we essentially are the client um, who we have developed the technology for. And we continue to do that work till this day. So we can put ourselves in the shoes of a minister of health, in the shoes of a provincial health manager, in the shoes of a nurse who's in charge of a small clinic on a Monday morning and needs to move a queue of you know, 100 people through before noon. So we therefore, this fly on the wall sort of perspective allows us then to really figure out where the gaps are and how you can really be helpful um, in this situation, as opposed to burdening it with further requirements, um, which they actually can't absorb. The second thing really is, I think we, we imagined um, certain core fundamental obstacles very, very differently in terms of coming up with solutions for them. So the issue of interoperability or the data's on paper, et cetera. We sort of had to hack this and we sort of figured out 
a very, very simple way to hack that by focusing mm -hmm. on what are you actually trying, what does this person need to do their job better as opposed to what data do they need, right? And nobody needs more data, as the earlier speaker said. You need more answers. You need more intelligence. You need to know what to do next. Um, so really by focusing on this next best action and making sure that all our recommendations are anchored in that first and then we back into the data required, I think has been helpful. And then finally, I say we made a lot of mistakes. And um, I, I, I always say I think we, we've made every mistake in the book. And I believe if you haven't made those mistakes in the book, you actually can be quite dangerous. Uh, to in terms of not knowing what you're doing when you say you can implement some of these big things. So we've learned the hard way everything that goes into implementing and scaling up and rolling out these types of initiatives uh, properly and learned it from the point of view of mistakes and a lot of humility. So I think those three factors really have made us quite unique and have created good resonance for our offerings. That's great. Thank you, Ernest. And when you mentioned we essentially are the client we have developed the technology for. I love that. And I think uh, a lot of members of our audience are thinking about how they can move toward that mode of operating, which definitely sets you up for more success. Um, I want to go to Julian now. And I see some questions coming into the chat, so that's great. Keep them coming. Um, but first, to just get to better know each of our panelists. Um, Julian, just for a bit of further context for those who are less familiar, 2020 saw the creation of Global Health Labs. And previously, this work was housed within Intellectual Ventures, where you were the global health lead. So I wonder, beyond this reorganization, what has it meant in terms of an evolving approach at Global Health Labs to ensuring that innovations in the lab have real-world impact? Thank you uh, for the question. And thank you for the opportunity to clarify. So in terms of GHL Labs, uh, after the transition, uh, we got more committed to uh, uh, to health equity in the sense that uh, if you look at our mission, it's to help develop innovative technologies that improve healthcare access in the most underserved communities. And uh, these are mostly in low and middle income countries. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary team of about 100 employees and we are based in Seattle. And uh, we recently refined our strategy, which, uh, which is focus on uh, development of uh, to technologies for MNCH uh, diagnostics and uh, generally primary health care. Uh, while at the transition, I would say many of the 100 that I mentioned, uh, some of them transitioned from the older uh, 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 entity. Right now, we are a nonprofit that is independent, and our work is mostly focused in driving innovation uh, to improve access to health care in uh, the settings that we target. And again, we also are aware that uh, these settings have variation in, uh, in, in terms of their maturity to provide healthcare uh, and quality of healthcare. So we are, we are grounded using the three I's, uh, which in, in involves technology development uh, that looks at how do you integrate existing technologies to make them function, uh, their functionalities optimized? And then how do you improve the existing ones, improve their performance. And then the last one is innovation, where you kind of uh, stretch out to uh, to develop technologies that have actually never been seen or building of existing to improve them. And we believe that uh, digital health is a very critical aspect of uh, these three eyes. Uh, so just use an example, for example, if you look at technologies like uh, rapid diagnostic tests that most people who work in development uh, are aware of. These technologies can be improved by integrating, say, by digital solutions that uh, enable easier readership of uh, the results. And then further, uh, it can be improved also, uh, say, ultrasound that was mentioned, uh, um, ultrasound aided uh, with AI can enable more capabilities of the device that was underutilized because of either low scale or access issues. And then when you look at innovation, uh, some of these technologies are available, but very expensive. But breaking through uh, the ceiling and uh, trying to go deep and innovate can bring about more affordable uh, technologies that leverage some of the science that has been uh, groundbreaking uh, out there. So uh, with that, I will pause there. Thanks, Julian. I, I want to ask each of you something. And I was struck by 
uh, in Benjamin's response about how MacroEyes, uh, you know, how its approach has really helped the organization scale and its technology scale. Uh, he started with a story about David Senge. Um, and so I want to hear from each of you a story about partnership. Um, and I'll actually start with you, Julian, if that's all right. So you mentioned the three eyes. You mentioned a couple examples um, in terms of digital health and, and, and applying the three eyes to digital health. But can you just tell us a story about uh, partnership playing a meaningful role in addressing what you mentioned, mentioned is increasingly front and center for global health labs, uh, access to healthcare and health equity? Just tell us a story about how that's played out. In, in, in terms of access and equity, the uh, thing that can quickly come to mind is uh, digital device connectivity. And I would say, uh, if you look at most of the technologies we do definitely are for healthcare, and it's a balance between those that are directly used for care. And uh, the one that I'm talking about is uh, to enable us optimize available equipment to keep them functional and stretch their uh, life uh, of functionality to, to what is expected. And this is uh, because if you think about some of the equipment, we've heard about graveyards of equipment. So having the connectivity between uh, equipment and monitoring them uh, in a sense that uh, you provide the managers of the equipment information that guides them on things like maintenance, guides them on things like planning and uh, reallocation of technologies where they're used in within the same geography, where they underutilized to where they're most utilized. Uh, to do this, uh, we're working closely with uh, uh, CPHD in Kenya and uh, Nextleaf um, that has uh, expertise in that area of, uh, uh, of monitoring, uh, using AI and digital solutions to monitor equipment and other uh, health uh, platforms. And for yeah. this, we've been able to work closely on the ground with uh, providers who uh, because of the connection with uh, a party, a partner that is on the ground, it has been very, I would say, helpful to meet the actual needs of uh, the, the target users, as well as uh, working closely with the Ministry of Health to enable that device be designed for the actual needs of the patients, uh, the providers, as well as the decision makers who are very critical for the success of this tool. And um, this is just an example. We work with a wide range of uh, partners uh, from academia and some of the tech giants as well, like Google, for some of our AI work in ultrasound. And uh, um, we, we see a lot of uh, leverage happening with working with partners because we're able to leverage different expertise for a common goal and also be able to uh, think about scale in mind as we develop these technologies, because doing that at the beginning and making sure we have the right partners enables us to achieve our goal and decide, design a technology that will actually be used and will have the potential for scale uh, in some of the target areas that we work in. Thank you, Julian. And hearing from some of our other panelists in terms of stories of partnership that have been really meaningful, perhaps turning points or learning moments, um, Let's bring Ernest into this. Can you share an example from Broadreach? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'd say um, our, our sort of a cosmic soulmate innovation partner is uh, the Department of Health of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Um, we've had a very long um, ongoing relationship with them since 2004 uh, when we're introduced to them to be their technical assistance partners. This is long before we're talking about tech or tech solutions or doing anything. And they've always shown this remarkable uh, ability and sort of propensity to innovate and be innovative. Uh, so back in the day, for example, they were the first province to, in, we, we worked together to introduce um, the first cervical cancer vaccine uh, for children in the country, and that ultimately got scaled up to become a, a national program. They created a in really innovative uh, management model that brought together all the different spheres of government uh, to provide one point of service for delivery at the community level, you know, at the ward level. Um, and that became actually written up as a global best practice by UNAIDS. And um, so 
we have a history of sort of innovating together. And in essence, that um, has allowed us to take bigger and bigger risks together. And that the trust has meant that now we kind of don't need to pilot things, even, you know, so when we came in 2014 and said, look, we want to use AI and machine learning and big data, you know, to help improve how your HIV program, they were like, we're in, right? And, um, and we co-developed the version one with them and scaled it up to the entire province. And so they've been able to do kind of remarkable things, um, but, uh, you know, with, because of the fact that they scaled up. And one of my biggest sort of pet peeves about global health at the moment is things that don't scale up because that's millions wasted where if it's not going to scale up, you may as well not do it, you know. So they really have have, a, have developed the, the, the DNA, you know, the, the, the genotype and the phenotype um, that, uh, that is innovative, that allows them to take new ideas and to run with them and scale, which is kind of atypical for a typical public sector program. So it's been a really, really fruitful relationship, I think, on both sides. And we look forward to doing more th good things with them in the future. Thank you, Ernest. I think a lot of people uh, joining us for Prescription for Progress share that pet peeve. <laughs> and it's part of why we're having this conversation. Absolutely. Uh, Safa, what about you? What's a story from Zenesis's work in terms of partnership adding value? Yeah, sure. Uh, when I think about partnerships, one one that really sticks out for me is uh, our strategic partnership with the Global Fund that we formed in 2018, focused on um, HIV, TB, and malaria. Uh, and this partnership really um, aimed to expand the access of uh, big data and artificial intelligence to um, Global Fund-supported countries. Uh, now, what makes this partnership uh, truly special for us is uh, that, as you know, or as you will know, I'm, 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 South Africa has the largest number of people living with HIV, um, and thus was one of the first countries to to benefit from this partnership. Um, and contextualizing this problem of HIV in, in South Africa, turning the tide on the epidemic, it, it depends on providing a comprehensive set of services to um, HIV AIDS key key populations. And these are populations that are high at a high risk of um, contracting HIV. Uh, and, and these include the, the, the population of sex workers. Uh, but reaching these populations is, is really no easy task. Um, and to do this, we partnered with NACOSA, an, an organization which is a principal recipient of the Global Fund, whose goal is to collaborate with uh, 2,500 uh, um, network partners to fight HIV AIDS um, and TB in Southern Africa. And as we started working with NACOSA, we quickly realized that the challenges that they faced in terms of providing a robust continuum of care to sex workers were immense. Um, and one of the main factors here was that uh, due to institutional distrust and, and fear of prosecution, uh, sex workers who need HIV counseling or treatment falsify their identities just to protect their privacy. Um, uh, so this often means that on every encounter between a sex worker and a community health worker, uh, the sex worker may provide a different name or other identifying information. Uh, to, to get closer to, to the ground truth of this problem, we deepened our partnerships and, and, and engagement and began working really with uh, NACOSA's sub-implementers who provide HIV um, prevention and treatment services to sex workers throughout the country. And with all these partnerships in place, we helped NACOSA use the platform to automatically integrate, match and merge sex worker profiles across all of these organizational databases. Um, this produced the first integrated picture of a continuum of care for sex workers in South Africa, including a very clear picture of where people were falling through the cracks. And by this, I mean um, the people who received positive tests but um, were not on treatment and, and could not be identified because they'd, they'd given different um, identifying information. Uh, so the outcome of this work is that through this technology, these organizations can now accurately track the progress of sex workers through the continuum of care by mitigating the effects of data quality caused by this inherent mistrust in the ecosystem. Uh, this opens a door for community health uh, centers to provide more tailored and individualized care to these patients. And it also allows at the same time that sex workers are able to, uh, to, to, to um, retain a certain level of privacy uh, and, and, and while still reducing the barriers to them receiving quality health care. So as, as I mentioned before, this, this is truly meaningful for us because not only have we collaborated to build trust between a network of organizations um, through transparent data sharing, but we've also been able to bridge sig a significant gap in, in existing within the ecosystem that, that, uh, that, that really inhibits um, uh, um, the progress of uh, or, or, or the access to healthcare for, for sex workers. Um, as a final point here, uh, uh, and uh, just to close up, while you know, technology has moved the dial for NACOS and particularly the sex work program, 
um, this wasn't the prog- uh, this wasn't, the, it wasn't a, a problem that that technology alone could solve. And I think the results that I've just spoken about are a great example of how the power of partnerships um, uh, uh, can can really enable technology to full to to meet its full potential, you know, in saving lives. Thank you, Safa. And very quickly, because I want to bring in an audience perspective, Benjamin, you started us off with a great story, but is there another story that comes to mind or or um, perhaps it's that initial interaction with David Senge in terms of um, partnership playing a meaningful yeah. role in macroIS work? Yeah, I'll, um, there is another story. It, it's again said in Sierra Leone. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a story that's relevant for all of us in, in COVID times who spend too much time over Zoom. Um, so about a year into our engagement with the government of Sierra Leone, um, colleagues both at, at DSTI um, and the Ministry of Health and Sanitation suggested that there would be several people essentially seconded to this engagement um, as, as AI experts. And it, I, I, the, the, the notion of the importance of people um, for deploying advanced technology, and this will sound naive and simple, um, is just it, people being in a room together is, is so important. There's, there's a, there's a, and, and I'm gonna sort of link this back, I think, to all of us having lived through this period where we're always talking over Zoom. I, ironically, many of the engagements that are really person to person are perhaps easier to do over Zoom, but engagements that involve technical problem solving are perhaps harder to do over Zoom. So you could say sort of work that involves computers and data and thinking through how a problem might be solved in a different way technically, there's even more of a need for a human connection. And and this model that was taught to us by the government of Sierra Leone of saying, we are going to essentially uh, deploy two people to to sit inside of this, this deployment of technology, we're going to repeat that all across the world. Um, it's it's invaluable. It's a way to turn our customer into an ambassador within that broader organization where they get to learn um, from our perspective of what machine learning is. Um, and we get to use people who have a much deeper understanding of how our technology works and why to, to be in conversations that we cannot be a part of. So I, I, I guess just to, to summarize, I'll say something again, it sounds so obvious that for exceedingly technical problems, having people together is probably essential. It cannot be done solely um, over a computer screen. That's a great point. And I think something a lot of people have been struggling with. Uh, I wanna go ahead and introduce a perspective from our audience. Natasha Sunderji is Global Health Lead at Accenture Development Partnerships. And Natasha, I'd love to hear quickly any reactions you have or a question for our panelists. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Given our time, I'll probably jump straight to my question. As you rightly pointed out at the beginning of the session, the use of digital platforms to address health challenges has seen exponential growth since the beginning of the pandemic. And leading platforms like those presented in today's discussion have been at the forefront of that growth. However, that growth has not been experienced equally across all segments of our global population. We continue to see large gaps in access based on age, gender, socioeconomic status, and beyond. So to our panelists, as we continue to push for growth of digital health solutions, how do we mitigate the risk of replicating the existing health inequities that we are seeing? What role do you see partnerships playing in addressing this challenge? Yeah, I, I think I'll, I think I'll jump in here and maybe just tack on to my last response. I think a good example of this is what I mentioned about our partnership with Nicosa and, and ensuring that sex workers an often marginalized population um, receive the care that they need. Uh, Critical to addressing this challenge with Nicosa was the strength of our partnership with both Nicosa and the Global Fund. At the end of the day, we ourselves aren't health experts and we rely on the decades and decades of insights um, um, that these organizations have to guide the way we address these inequalities. Uh, I'd like to say just maybe to close off here because I do want to be quick is that we are lucky to have networks of, of supportive donors and partners who are truly invested in, in putting their time and resources forth and guiding us down this journey. And to put simply, that's been critical to our success in this regard. Thanks, I'll, jump 
Julian, quickly, yes, please. Yes, I'll quickly jump in and say that in our design, we use the approach that we are very aware of the differences in uh, maturity of health systems and capabilities uh, from those that are really underdeserved uh, and working towards coverage to more advanced that uh, need technologies that can uh, improve um, their capabilities. So that enables us to design technologies uh, to meet the specific needs of uh, the different levels of health systems uh, to provide capabilities for the providers, as well as provide capabilities uh, from the level of the decision makers who decide on, on what technologies should be allocated where. So giving them information that guides them in doing that has been very helpful through uh, what we envision as uh, the digital device connectivity of medical devices but also in the applying human-centered design approaches in designing technologies that meet the actual need of uh, uh, less advanced and more advanced. We feel much as uh, there's need to improve uh, coverage in, say, very underdeserved, there's also need to facilitate those that are already advanced to tap on some of the developments that are happening in technology. But we aim to balance our approach to make sure that there's equity across these different levels. Thank you, Julian. I'm sorry, Benjamin and Ernest, that we've run out of time. I know you have thoughts to share on this. I do want to zoom in on the illustration for everyone to take a look at, which captures a lot of what we've covered. Um, for, for the responses we couldn't get to in response to uh, Natasha's fantastic question, as well as some of the questions that came up in the chat, I'm going to bring those to our breakout session later today and, and hope we have the opportunity to dig a little deeper into this important topic. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and to our audience for joining.